be honest, horror can be an incredibly tropey genre. Like, even the most popular pieces of horror media can be full of tropes, cliches, and deadbeat and horses. And that's fine. There is comfort and stability and familiarity, and genres are there to establish a frame of reference, a lens through which the audience can approach a piece of art. But because especially horror is a medium that relies so strongly on subverting the audience's expectations, it can be quite refreshing and exciting to try out something that walks off the beaten path and does something that hasn't been done like that before. That can be anything really, a new unexplored setting, a new set of gameplay mechanics that you haven't played like this before, a storytelling style that feels different than anything you've encountered, or generally something that feels different than what you expect when you see the tag, horror. The perfect place for that is indie games. So today we're gonna look at four games, all available on the storefront of itch.io, that all left a striking impression because of the ways in which they approach the idea of horror in different, alternative ways. The first game today is about the literal manifestation of the deepest depth of hell right here on Earth. Retail. It's Monday. You just arrived at your new job in the department store. As you drop your bag off in the locker room, your boss, the manager, greets you with a warm, welcoming smile, a heartfelt pep talk, and an excited introduction to your new family of motivated, diligent co-workers. Your first shift is only a short while before closing time, and the consumers are already prowling the store's ales with their unrelenting thirst for grade-A products and customer service, and there's plenty of shelves to be restocked. It's your job to keep the store in mint condition. Our hearts and souls belong to the client. Time to go to work in the shit factory. Night of the Consumers is a wonderful example for a game that creates the tension and anxiety of a frenetic horror game, but realized with unconventional, satirical means. It appropriates dead-beaten horror tropes to repurpose them in a setting that everyone who's ever worked in a similar job is painfully aware of. Retail Hell. The game itself is a comparably simple but tough-as-nail stealth game. You grab cardboard boxes scattered between the ales, carry them to their section, and restock shelves with the items in them. Simple. But while you're doing that, you're literally haunted by seemingly brain-dead consumer zombies charging at you with relentless speed to assault you with nagging questions. I need something to clean my skin. Find me something to wipe my protein shake spill with. Where are the toasters? I lost my baby. Find it. Once a client grabs a hold of you, you have very little time to fulfill their wishes, or Karen will go to the manager. And the manager has no patience for lacking customer service. One mistake and you're... Fire. Yeah, the game is unrelenting. Because I just never relent. One little slip up and you're back home filling out unemployment forms. And this will happen a lot, especially in the beginning. The customers charge at you seemingly out of nowhere and with a walking speed that puts Doomguy to shame. Plus, the way the game frames this, the violent screen shake, the efficient use of low-poly, low-texture face models, the obnoxiously closed dialogue camera, it's genuinely startling and unsettling, so much so that the ubiquitous EXCUSE ME exclamations all across the store become more frightening than the hungry moaning of a herd of real zombies in no time. But the game emits a strange appeal posing the challenge to prevail and make it till the end of the shift. So in order to stand through to the end, you will have to burn the store's layout into your cerebral cortex, know by heart which items go where, develop uncanny spatial awareness to the next staff room in your vicinity, to always be ready to slip away from customers in a pinch and even strategize your approach. It's fascinating how tight and stressful it can become, but also how satisfying it is if you manage to make it through the day effort justification. Yeah, Night of the Consumers is definitely the dark souls of retail simulations. But the thing that I find the most fascinating about Night of the Consumers is that, yes, it is a comical hyperbole on working in retail, but the stuff that effectively scares you in this game are the same things that makes working in retail such a widely recognized token of neoliberal hell. When you give your meaningless job everything you got, 
power walking through the aisles to get your quota in before the end of your shift, a disoriented patron approaching you with a self-righteous excuse me, only to send you to the other side of the store and search for something that's boldly signposted, will quickly become a nastier scare than any ghost or slasher movie could ever conjure. But you gotta keep smiling, because you're a wage slave, and because a client is always right. Everyone who's ever done this for a living knows how stressful, how draining, and how utterly thankless it can be. And Night of the Consumers portrays that quite accurately. That feeling of being a disposable human resource in the eyes of your employer's shareholders. Better, happier, more productive, getting on better with your associate employee contemporaries at ease. And let me be a little bit pretentious here, because one thing that really struck me about Night of the Consumers is that it's possibly one of the best thematic adaptations of the forebear of modern zombie culture. The parallelism between hordes of zombie drones and brain-dead consumers is not just an apt observational metaphor, it's also the very notions our modern zombie mythology originated from. Because George A. Romero, far more than creating an ode to carnal violence as the genre has been molded into over the years, delivered a cynical condemnation of Western consumerism with his original Dawn of the Dead. Because both in its plot and subtext, the film already screamed that if you want to avoid brain-dead zombies, the mall is the last place you should go. At the time of release of this video, Night of the Consumers is available on itch.io for $1.93. Video games are a strange type of media because it's the only one that comes to memory where a genre can be defined by a very specific set of gameplay mechanics. First person shooter, real time strategy. Horror, on the other hand, is an exception among video games because it describes the emotional frame of reference for the piece in question, like it is with other types of media. And as such, you can technically have anything. Like, you can have a horror game that is a first-person shooter. You can have a horror game that is a real-time strategy game. You can have a horror game that is a life simulation. You can have anything with a horror descriptor. The next game is a great example for that because it's Gameplay mechanics are something that you would usually not associate with horror, besides maybe the overall aesthetic. But Sacrifices Must Be Made takes the classic tabletop card game and turns it into a genuinely unsettling horror experience. You find yourself in a wooden cabin, sitting at a table, hungry and alone. A pair of eyes stares at you from the other side of the table. Without any further explanation, its voice starts teaching you a card game. But this tabletop game is more than meets the eye, because in order to win, sacrifices must be made. This game was made by Daniel Mullins, creator of Pony Island and The Hex, and if you've played any of his previous games, you know you're in for some crafty shit. The moment I found out that this horror card game was made by the maker of Pony Island, seriously, you should play Pony Island, it's brilliant, a lot of thoughts on sacrifices must be made that stuck with me fell into place for me. Because even though it's a very, very different game thematically, you'll immediately recognize the creator's sense for clever twists on conventional mechanics and his aptitude for hiding a lot of depth in gameplay in plain sight. It's a proof-of-concept project developed for the 48-hour game jam Ludum Dare, and it probably won't take you more than 20-30 minutes to complete. But it uses that brief runtime expertly, building mood and tension as it sets up a disturbing mystery. The game itself is mechanically simple enough. Each card you're being dealt has attack and health values displayed on the bottom left and right, respectively. And a few cards feature special abilities like flying creatures that can soar over opposing cards, a cat that doesn't die when sacrificed, and an elk that moves to a different spot after attacking. The title comes into play with the cards that display one or more blood droplets in the top right corner, because these cards cannot simply be played, and by that I mean moved from your hand to the table in front of you, very similar to how it works in classic deck builders like Magic the Gathering. In order to put these cards on the table, you have to sacrifice cards that are already being played to feed the more powerful cards, to pay their blood toll. 
and each time a player attacks and breaks through their opponent's defense line, the damage caused is represented by small wooden tokens that are placed on the opponent's pan of a scale. When your pan reaches the bottom, you lose the game. The entity sitting across the table calmly and patiently teaches you all of this, and more, with a voice more akin to a deep rumble than spoken words. You get the impression that you feel the words instead of just hearing them, as if its thoughts reverberate somewhere within your ancient reptilian brain. The voice's deep, pulsating vibrato is unnerving from the first word spoken or uttered. And through all of that, the piercing sound of the end turn bell is a resounding wake-up call that you're plunging deeper into this nightmare. That there is no winning in this game. Your opponent, an undefinable entity that appears to be literally invading, reading your very thoughts, is always three steps ahead of the curve. With very little means, this game makes you feel like the cards are stacked against you. Pun intended. As you play and do your best to prevail, hungry and alienated, trying to survive this macabre cerebral gauntlet, you eventually realize how things are getting tougher and tougher over time, until it seems like there's no way you're going to get the upper hand against your opponent. It is in this very moment when the entity offers you a knife. The rules explicitly state that the one whose weighing pan hits the floor loses the game, but never specifies what it is that needs to be put on there in order to tip the scales in your favor. It makes a dark insinuation hang heavily in the air between you and your captor. As the game goes on, you realize that the initial promise you are given sounds more and more like a threat. Most of your adversary's cards are people but they're depicted as shadows and soulless husks. The cards you're given, on the other hand, are all animals, a few of which are praised by the entity. And it starts dawning on you. Your opponent clearly telegraphs its moves to you. It even tells you at times. And when things get hairy, it offers you the knife. A chance to turn things around? Maybe it wants you to win. Maybe it wants to feed you. And with this game, it wants you to come to the realization of just how much of your humanity, of your soul, you're willing to sacrifice in order to stay alive. The game's designer is currently working on Inscription, a full-fledged game that expands on the idea and the concept. Sacrifice must be made already works phenomenally on its own, despite being made in just 48 hours and only spanning about half an hour of playtime, but from start to finish, this game oozes atmosphere and potential. When I'd reached the ending for the first time, and then replayed it several times, I found myself wishing for there to be more. So I'm not gonna lie, if Inscription ends up being just that, sacrifice must be made, but more of that, I'm already really, really excited for it. But knowing that the game is made by Daniel Mullins, I can't help but think that it's gonna be much more than that. Until then, I guess even more sacrifices must be made. By myself playing the game one more time and again and one more time and again and just once more and just one more time sacrifices must be made is available to download on itch.io for free Retro aesthetic, like PS1-style lo-fi rendering, pixel art, or raster graphics, are a fairly common stylistic device, especially among indie developers. For one, it's a convenient development scope shortcut for small teams to reduce the production scope of a game while still delivering a compelling aesthetic. But while most developers employ this in a hauntological way, trying to establish a sense of fake nostalgia in the audience, the Austrian solo developer Christoph Frey has turned the purposeful use of lo-fi aesthetic and techniques in order to evoke very specific, deliberate emotions in the players into an art form. He's released several games or pieces of audiovisual interactive art in the past that all share one common thematic kernel. Manipulating the player's senses and impressions through the distinct use, or rather, omission, of fidelity. 
In this 2011 game Protest, for instance, players navigate a space purely by sound, without any rendered visuals. While the 2012 title Horror Vacui lets players experience a comatose, dreamlike state, where empty spaces between apparitions and memories imbue feelings of disorientation and panic through the use of distorted rendering, noise, and other low fidelity effects. And his newest title, The Space Between, feels in many ways like a culmination of themes and techniques he's experimented with in the past. I've been meaning to cover this game for a good while, and alternative horror is probably the best fitting tag for the space between that I can think of. Because this is not a game that startles you with ghosts, monsters, or things that go bump in the night. It's a very intimate story about repressed feelings and desires and the inability to form human connections. A tale that left me confused and bewildered the first time playing it, but also one that I just couldn't stop thinking about. Its pacing is languid and slow, ponderously so, and this is something that irritates a lot of players. But every time a sentence in a conversation remains on screen for just a little too long, every time the movement speed is turned agonizingly slow, every time you're confused which character is currently actually speaking, all these things are done 100% on purpose. And if you meet the game in its own terms, this is highly effective. Because mechanically, the game itself is rather minimalistic. A first-person narrative experience largely told on rails, with the player moving around in its drawn-out, static environments from story beat to story beat. And not just mechanically, also artistically, Phi paints a powerful picture through minimalism. The space between makes most out of often very little, and conveys a lot of meaning through clever framing and effective setup of scenery and environment. The story itself is based around the architect Martin Melanson, who is currently building a theater, when he encounters a woman named Clara outside of his apartment complex one night. They start talking and feel drawn to one another, and begin exploring the unfinished stage and the catacombs beneath the stage, and the secrets hidden within. The perception of reality slowly begins to fade and the lines between performance and reality, between the audience, actors, and the players, begin to blur. I deliberately refrain from discussing the game's story in this video in further detail because I want you to experience it completely for yourself and form your own impressions and draw your own conclusions, without biasing your view on anything beforehand because this is a game where it's incredibly easy to, even inadvertently, coat someone's perception and interpretation by retelling its elements through one's personal lens. Because for a roughly hour-long, slow-paced narrative, the space between leaves its conclusions refreshingly open to subjective interpretation. When the space between keeps dialogue lines on the screen for much longer than you need to read and grasp its meaning, it stays just long enough for you to not just consume the prose, but for your mind to start digesting it, pondering over it. Oftentimes, for instance, when it's unclear who's talking right now, you might interpret it in different ways than somebody else or even the writer, and that subtly or drastically can change the meaning of the conversation. But there is no right or wrong way to read it. It is how you choose to read it. If you are interested in a really good story analysis and dissection of this game though, I recommend you check out Chris Franklin's video, who beat me to the punch by a couple of months with it. It's a fantastic video, but if you don't want to spoil yourself, maybe watch it after playing The Space Between. That would be my recommendation. For me personally, this game achieved something incredibly rare and beautiful as a horror game. Most horror media are the most effective when you experience them for the first time. Replay a spooky game while knowing it's in and outs, and a lot of the scare factor gets lost. But the space between has achieved the opposite for me. When I first played it, I wasn't even sure if I'd categorize it as a horror game in the first place. I only knew that it fascinated me. But once I replayed it and met the game on its own terms, you know, agreed to go along with its languid pacing, letting myself in on its unconventional and uncompromising delivery, and the more thought I gave to the things it wants the player to ponder upon, the more, I don't want to say scary, but the more terrifying its concluding act became for me. 
The Space Between is a game that exactly knows what it's building up to, and once I respected its unique tone and style, it made its epiphanies hit home so much harder. It's beautiful, and you should give it a chance. And the struggle to connect with others, not just despite, but through what divides us, it has almost presently become more relevant than ever before lately, hasn't it? The Space Between is available on itch.io for $5.99. The next game on my list is another retail simulator. How original. Happy's Humble Burger Barn is a food simulator where you work night shift in a burger restaurant. I honestly don't even know why this made the list, or how for that matter, but if it's on here then I guess there's a good reason for it. There is a very good reason for why this game is on this list, but I cannot disclose that here because doing so would violate the non-disclosure Uh, either way, it's, it's on my list, so I guess we'll just talk about it. I mean... <gasps> Maybe the horror is, once again, the job itself. Working fast food, and as Night of the Consumers has already demonstrated, most service industry jobs can be a haunting nightmare, even when the world isn't on fire. Perhaps it's the salmon nuggets. I mean, look at these burnt abominations. And imagine attempting to eat one. Or worse, giving them to someone else to eat? Ooh. But commendable, Happy's Humble Burger Barn is so dedicated to simulating the experience of working a service job that it even decided to include the commute. You drive along the nighttime road of the outskirts of the big city, listening to pseudo-nostalgic 80s-inspired vapor wave on the way to the barn. It's a nice touch, as is having to park by the dumpster. I'm sure if smell o vision had taken off, it would even be olfactorily authentic. The fact the player is alone for the night shift, aside from being a convenient development scope restraint, is another hauntingly realistic touch. It seems Happy, like your boss, if that's really his name, is a practitioner of lean staffing. The game itself is hard to put into a genre box, but if I'd have to coin one for it, it would be surprisingly holistic, utterly janky, ordinary life simulator. The basics of the simulation experience are here, like making food. Serving customers. And throwing out the huge trash bags. The experience itself is deceptively simple, but peculiarly engaging. Conspicuously identical and robotic customers amble in, calmly place an order, and then patiently wait as you put it together. I say deceptively simple because there are hidden depths to Happy's Humble Burger Barn. Meat patties require well-timed cooking, and the burgers themselves require skillful assembly on the magic cutting board. All of this while keeping tabs on the french fry fryer, the soda machine, and the salmon nuggets. There's a lot for the player to manage. In addition to burger assembly, there are fries, milkshakes, soft drinks, which look similar, but you know, they have different colored lids, so there's some more depth here. And finally, there are you know, the, the salmon nuggets. Uh, look at these Inthmythian droppings. Who in their right mind would ever order or eat something like that? And they're next to the french fries, which suggests that they come out of the same fryer. So does that mean that the fries in this place all taste like salmon nuggets? That's not what salmon looks like. And fries salmon anyway. And furthermore, what kind of criminal would burn salmon? <sniffs> if I weren't vegetarian already, these salmon nuggets would convert me in a heartbeat. I think I'm getting to the bottom of why this game is part of the collection of alternative horror games. No, you're not. Anyway, once you have the orders ready, yeeting them at the customers is pretty satisfying, not gonna lie. As I'm sure you've noticed by now, this is not the most technically advanced game. And once again, we find ourselves in environments that would fit more on a humble PS1 than on modern high-end PCs. But it looks charming. And it also fits the artificially nostalgic vaporwave car ride to work aesthetic. Sure, the burger ingredients look like blurry piles, the customers look like one person. Continually changing outfits to make us question reality, and the salmon nuggets look like that. 
Am I in some kind of lo-fi life simulation here, like a drone hooked up to the Matrix, entrenched in a simulation that we're not able to tell from reality, even though the seams are striking us in the face? You gotta tell them! Silent Green is people! We gotta stop them! Happy Sumble Burger Bun is available on the child for free. All of the games shown today are available on itch.io, a platform I highly recommend if you want to discover a plethora of great indie titles, many of which are completely free of charge. One final thing I want to mention, and keep highlighting, is that on itch, if you want to support the labor of indie devs, when buying a game or claiming one for free, you get the option to name your own price, namely to leave a little tip for the makers, and if you can afford it, I'd encourage you to do so. It can go a long way for small developers that often consist of one to less than a handful of people. And speaking of voluntary crowdfunding, donations are also the most important and primary source of income for this channel. And at the time of release of this video, we're currently at nearly 90% of the most important funding milestone for this channel. So if you enjoy my videos or get something meaningful out of them and can spare a dollar or more a month without it financially kneecapping you, hop over to my Patreon and help out and join the community. Thank you so much for considering, my gratitude to those who already support me there, and a special thank you this time goes out to Andrew Hines, Kenan Ward, Laird Wackala, Swallowtail Knights, Jin Hansen, Evan Tickre, Max Macula, Cordelia Crescendo, Hunter Crawford and Margaret Strawn, Matt Gretton, Faulty Gear, Lawrence E. Buben, Mauricio Reyna, Ty McCandless, Alan Wilder, Wobbles and Bean, The Wonder Ducks, Dennis Pfefferkorn, Malim, Chuck Taylor, Thwagum, Dr. Haley Isabella Colley, Billy Lott, Kevin H. Yang, Nathan O'Connor, Mura Casardis, Terry Collins, Casper Rahm, Adriel Garcia, Nobad Gerard Matinka, Dana Rosa, Pablo Arcelis, Chris Chan, Gehenas, Quentin Podom, Dimitar Slatko, Christine, Daniel242172, Giselle Almonte, Chrissy, Jordan, Agustin Ortega, Kenan Ward, and Catherine Escobar. Until next time, ta-ta!